the Six-Day War, third of five Arab-Israeli wars, a conflict whose outcome was made inevitable by air power on the first day. A war fought on three fronts, each quite different. The Sinai Desert, scene of dramatic tank battles and the destruction of an entire army. The largely urban street battles in Jordan as the Israelis fought their way into the holy city of Jerusalem. And the mountainous Golan Heights, torn from Syrian control by bulldozers, tanks, and infantry. Israel was created by the United Nations partition of Palestine in 1947, giving 45% to the Arabs and 55% to the new Jewish state. The Israelis gained further territory when hostile Arab reaction led to war. All five Arab nations declared war in an attempt to stifle Israel at birth. Israelis struggled for their state's very existence, creating a defence force characterised by officer-led units and reliance on flexibility, surprise and innovation. The 1949 armistice established new borders, largely where the opposing army's front line stood at the end of hostilities. But the conflict also created huge numbers of Palestinian refugees. 350,000 fled to Jordan, mostly to the West Bank area. Unlike Jewish refugees, the Palestinians were not absorbed by their new host countries. Instead, they were left in camps where they became a focus for Arab discontent. With no lasting peace, a revolution in Egypt bringing Gamal Abd al Nasser to power made another war increasingly likely. Assuming command of the combined armies of Egypt, Jordan and Syria, his avowed intention was the destruction of Israel, but the Israelis resolved to strike first. An Egyptian blockade of Tehran prompted the Israeli offensive, which opened with a paratroop drop near the strategic Mitla Pass, backed by armoured assaults. The campaign then gradually built up momentum with attacks to isolate the bulk of the Egyptian army in the north and to end the blockade that had been denying Israeli access to the sea. The Israeli plan was designed to keep the Egyptians guessing whether it was an all-out offensive or just another reprisal raid. Both sides used weapons mainly of Second World War vintage in battles that demonstrated the lasting importance of tanks. Israel's victory proved she had built an effective army on the experiences of the 1948 War of Independence, an army marked by a positive ability to adapt to rapidly changing circumstances. And the architect of that victory, General Moshe Dayan, would go on to repeat it more spectacularly in 1967. Egyptian strategy was flawed. It kept strong forces close to the Israeli border, but most of them on the wrong side of the Suez Canal. They therefore celebrated a victory, maintaining that they'd been forced to withdraw under threat from British and French forces. They had parachuted in to secure the Suez Canal, recently nationalised by NASA. Scuttled ships remained as a sign that little had been achieved to bring peace to the region. Israeli settlements were attacked, some shelled, others were the target of guerrilla raids by Palestinian Fedayeen. The tempo of tit-for-tat border raids and reprisals grew as the Israelis dug in to protect themselves. They responded by mounting cross-border raids, first against villages sheltering terrorists, then against regular military bases. This was Jenin in Jordan. Over a decade, a thousand Israelis died, but little is known about Arab casualties. In 1964, an Arab scheme to divert the waters of the River Jordan away from Israel heightened tension further, bringing the Israelis to the brink of war. The biggest Israeli reprisal raid brought armour and air power onto the village of Al Samu in Jordan. It was also the first Israeli raid mounted in daylight. Al Samu had been a forward base for Fedayeen from Syria, mounting raids on Israeli settlements in the northern Negev near the Dead Sea.
In April 1967, a major dogfight developed between Syria's Russian MiGs and Israel's French-built Mystères as the Israelis struck at Syrian artillery that had been shelling settlements. In a foretaste of the war soon to follow, six Syrian MiGs were lost. Alarm, the Syrians sought Egyptian help. They responded by demanding withdrawal of the United Nations troops who'd been guarding Israel's southern border by occupying Sinai since the 1956 war. In mid-May, the United Nations Secretary General Uthant unilaterally agreed to this demand and the crisis deepened. Three days later, seven Egyptian divisions with over 100,000 men and 1,000 tanks had massed along Israel's southwestern border. Huge armoured convoys were on the move too in Jordan. Jordan's leader, King Hussein, was more worried about seeming to be the odd man out in the Arab alliance than by the possibility of war. Within a week, Arab armies had massed at all Israeli borders, creating a crisis from which they hoped to gain political advantage. But as Arab war hysteria mounted, Egypt was unable to control that crisis and effectively backed Israel into a corner. The thousands who poured onto the streets were forcing action against the state they wanted to destroy for two decades. Israelis mobilized against what they saw as a clear threat. But time was vital. The Israelis couldn't keep their citizen army in uniform for much more than two weeks without endangering their economy. They also lacked the geographical depth to fight a defensive battle and then mount a successful counterattack. Defence through offensive action was their only option. To run that offensive, the Israelis brought in General Moshe Dayan as Minister of Defence. An underground fighter during the War of Liberation, he had proved a daring battalion commander who established the ruthless fighting spirit that typified Israeli operations. A brilliant strategist, he was the architect of a stunning victory. The Egyptian leader, Gamal Abd al Nasser, was the driving force who brought on the war, but he consistently underestimated Israeli strength and commitment while exaggerating Egypt's strength in a manner that proved fatal as he failed to foresee the tactics that would be employed against him. Jordan's King Hussein was Egypt's reluctant ally, afraid of being the odd man out among the Arab nations. He led the most effective Arab army, but was deceived by his allies losing half his kingdom as he was abandoned by Iraq and Syria. Hafiz al-Assad was the Syrian defence minister who saw his air force destroyed on the ground as he delayed opening a third front. His failure to help Jordan was bitterly resented by King Hussein. As the Arab nations moved their armies onto Israel's borders, Israel resolved to mount a preemptive blitzkrieg. It was spearheaded by the Air Force, which in the first few hours won complete air superiority by destroying the Arab Air Forces on the ground. The Israelis scrambled at breakfast time. In the first wave, French built Mystère fighter bombers. Air Force commanders had correctly assumed that the Egyptians would be unprepared, with most officers still driving to their bases. Peeling off to fly in low under Arab radar, the strike planes knocked out the Egyptian Air Force largely before it could leave the ground. crews flew some 500 sorties before mid-morning. At each briefing, pilots were told their first priority was to destroy planes on the ground, spending as long as possible over the target and returning on minimum fuel. Mirage 3s speed to their distant targets, flying low over the Mediterranean to evade Egyptian radar. Some Egyptian MiGs escaped the onslaught. 
Altogether, 19 Egyptian air bases were put out of action and over 400 planes destroyed as the Israeli jets arrived simultaneously over their targets. Those Egyptian planes that did get airborne were destroyed in dogfights. The Israelis lost 26 aircraft, but one air supremacy, which proved decisive in the fighting to come. This remarkable achievement was summed up by its architect, the daring and innovative Israeli air commander, Major General Mordecai Hod. The Egyptian Air Force was destroyed, or almost destroyed, in three hours. As a matter of fact, a little bit less than three hours, but we have, I'll make it around the figure. The achievement, of course, was made by pilots, very young ones. The average age of the Israeli pilots is about 23. They are all trained here by the Israeli Air Force. And now I can say they are the best pilots in the world. With command of the skies, Israeli armor mounted a complex series of lightning strikes, notably on Abu Agela and other key Egyptian fortified towns in northern Sinai and Gaza. A series of battles took them west to Bir Gafgafka and south to break the blockade of Tehran and complete the encirclement of the Egyptian divisions at Nakhle. Monday, June the 5th, 1967, and the Israelis prepared to launch their singularly devastating offensive across the Egyptian border. Here in the desert wastes, three Israeli divisions had gathered to face seven Egyptian divisions, a force nearly three times larger and with at least double the number of tanks. The assault was spearheaded by the British Centurion tank, which decisively outscored the Russian-built T-54-55s used by the Egyptians. Alongside them, jeeps with anti-tank recoilless rifles. The speed of the advance surprised the Egyptians, who expected the slower tempo of opening moves seen in 1956. But instead of striking at the center, the Israelis attacked Gaza. Breakthrough was achieved by the 7th Armoured Brigade, commanded by Colonel Shmuel Gonen. They outflanked